And there's some, uh, as I usually start, there's some talk about having another booster for COVID later on in the year. Uh, they're trying to tweak it to cover the Omicron better. Uh, so far, other than it's probably going to be released in the fall, not a lot of information is available. Just kind of pay attention. My gut feeling is that we'll probably end up being like the flu vaccine, unless they come up with some different technology, we'll probably need a, a vaccine like the flu vaccine every year or so, so we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but at this time, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how it means much to us, even though it was written so many years ago, because our human condition doesn't change. We still need you. Lord, open our minds and our hearts to your word so we can understand your direction for our life. In your son's name I pray, amen. amen. So we're going to be uh, on 416. Larry is still doing his construction, so he's not here today. Um, I'm glad to see Lynn's back with us. Doing okay? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Lynn, can you, start, can you start with 416, please? I'm sorry, did you four, 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 sixteen. 16? Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The Greek, therefore, is very emphatic, so very emphatically we do not lose heart. So we're wasting away. What is, what is he saying? That outwardly we are wasting away, Yet, and really, we're being renewed each day. What's he trying to say here? We're dying by steps. <laughs> yeah, we're dying day by day. But how are we being renewed? What's renewing us? Okay, my hearing is not as good as it used to be, so I'm going to ask people to speak up like you, Karen. <laughs> what are you saying? I think spiritually we are renewed day by day. Uh huh. But and so by the Spirit we're being renewed, by our, by our faith we're being renewed every day by day. Even though my wife and I did a lot of things this morning, and so, yesterday, so this morning, so, oh, I hate getting old, I'm so sore. <laughs> it takes so much longer, I was with some friends, we were all about the same age, talking about how it takes us so much longer to get things done than it used to be when we are in our 30s and 40s. And so, uh, every day, we get a little closer to being with the Lord, which means every day we get a little bit more in the Hawaiian Bukuli. Uh, and so we're wasting away, at, but we should be re, being renewed by the Spirit day by day. Dennis, 17? For a life of momentary troubles of achieving, are achieving for us the eternal glory so far as we see I don't know about you, but do you feel when you're in the midst of troubles that they're light and momentary? <laughs> Is Paul kind of downplaying things? Do you ever feel it, your troubles are light and momentary when you're in the middle of a problem? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's overwhelming. So why, why, is he, why is he saying that? He seems like he's making light of our troubles. What's he, what's he trying to say here? Yeah, and so yeah, that's basically, don't lose heart. It, our troubles that we have now might seem overwhelming and definitely not light and momentary, but if we're looking at the big picture of eternal life, you know, how small our time here in life is and how great and how long things are, are going to be when we're in heaven. So if you balance, then it does look light and momentary. So I have never had a light and momentary trouble in my life. <laughs> when I'm in the middle of it, they all seem to be very 
overwhelming and heavy and difficult and never going to go away. Um, but if you look at it at that way, that's why he's saying that. He's not, I don't think he's trying to make little of the troubles that sometimes we go through. Lance, 18 please. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things you cannot see will last forever. What uh, translation do you have? Oh. <laughs> That's okay. They're all good. Life That's... application study Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> and my in Abigo, so we fix our eyes on on what is seen but not but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is seen? What are we seeing? The world. The world. What's in front of us, you know, the, the life that we see in front of us. What is unseen? What is spiritual? The spirit. Exactly. And so what should we be looking for at? The spiritual What should we be, be focused on? Right. <laughs> so these, these verses are very really not, as Paul had been saying early, he's not writing anything that's difficult to understand or people can't discern. And so these verses are fairly straightforward. Uh, I guess I'll back up since we have a new <laughs> student with us today. I'm sorry. No, no, I wasn't talking about you, I was talking about your colleague over there. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> oh he's in the medical profession. <laughs> this is Paul's actual third letter to the Corinthians, but the, the middle one was lost. And Paul's first letter was trying to correct some problems, that, uh, answer some questions that were directed to him in a letter from the Corinthians, which we also don't have, and some observations for some people that came to him. Uh, he had sent a response, the Corinthians didn't respond well to them. He had made a trip to them to try to fix it, and that didn't go over well. You know, somebody confronted him, and the church didn't support him. He went back to Ephesus, where he was, and sent them uh, a, what he called a stern letter, which we don't know where he strongly rebuked them. And then uh, this letter is a follow-up letter where in the beginning he had sent uh, Titus up to check on how it was responded. He had, by this point in the letter, heard back from him. And this is basically his defense of his ministry, is what the second, what we call the second Corinthians is. His defense in, in this. So that's what's going on here in, in this letter. But now we're up to Marlene, you're uh, five one, please. Um, this is chapter five, verse one. A new body. So we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God Himself, and no fight in His hands. So some commentators regret the chapter break in this section. Remember that in original Greek there was actually no sentences, no, no chapter breaks, no verses. And they were put in hundreds of years later. So actually this section 416 through 510 is one section, even though it's two different chapters. The, the 416, 17, and 18 belong with one to 10 of 5, uh, but that's how, not how it's now broken up, but it, it really is the same section. So it goes on talking about what he's doing. Now we know that if the early, earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Now we know. What does he mean by that? Is it our body? As a mom, when you're talking to your kids, 
and say something like that. What are you telling them? Now we know. Now you know. What are you saying to them? You should know that. <laughs> this is something we talked about before. I've told you this how many times? <laughs> At least uh, that's how it goes in my house. Usually it's directed down to the kids or somebody else in the house. Anyway, uh, so now we know. So he's saying something that that it's been talked to them. He's preached to them. And, and so he's saying, you should know this. This is something we know. This is not something new. Now we know. He's basically saying, you should know this. This is, this is not something that hasn't been discussed before. What was Paul's occupation? He's a tent maker. So this is quite apt for, for him. Uh, he was a tent maker. So He's saying earthly tent, and he's using that as a metaphor for the body. Um, and so, to be destroyed, literally in the Greek, means to be tear, torn down. And so, <clears throat> you know, for him, as a, of course, as a tent maker, this is a metaphor that he would understand, that he would, since they used tents, back at that time a lot more than we use tents now only really people going out camping or maybe kids playing in the backyard use tents um, but anybody did any major traveling since they didn't have inns and motels and hotels like we do they tended to have to use a tent if they're doing any traveling at all whether or not for business or religion or just visiting family because uh, you couldn't go very far if you were walking. It would be a good day's walk if you did 12 miles uh, carrying your stuff on a donkey, but you'd be walking, most of the people. So if they're going in a significant distance, it would take a number of days and they would have to set up a, a tent along the way. So most people would really understand what this meant. You know, that every time your tent was always being taken down. And that since the tents were made out of leather, none of them lasted all that long either. <laughs> so if our bodies is being destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Who is going to build that for us? God. Okay, so is it something that we're building? No something that, that God's building for us. It's funny because God built our bodies to be able to build this, right? Because we didn't build our bodies ourselves. That's right. Yeah. So that's kind of confusing. But it's a different kind of body, I guess. Reconstruction. And as Paul says elsewhere in his letter that we understand, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm not going to be able to say it correct exactly, right? That, you know, we understand somewhat now. When we're in heaven, we'll understand fully. There's a whole lot of things I don't understand. And I don't think I'm ever going to understand exactly why God set this up. I have some suspicions, but I'm not sure I understand. And so why did he do it this way? Uh, I think I'll find out for sure at some point that you're right, God made us our bodies, but he made our bodies to be temporary. He made our spirit to be permanent, and our, we will have a permanent home for us believers. So, are we going to be homeless? No. No. Who might be homeless, though? The non-believers. The non-believers. So... <clears throat> We're not, we're not set up to be homeless. What's a good death? You know, the tent's going to be destroyed, I mean, and that's basically a metaphor for us dying. So what is your definition of a good death? The hint was what we just talked about. <laughs> Well, 
What? No picking. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that was Paul's getting at it here. What, what is a good death? Living with God. Living with God, exactly. And so dying in, with Christ, dying in Christ for Paul would be a good death. I don't think Paul thought that we would not suffer at the end. I don't think there's any expectation from Paul. Paul, if we go through his letters, spent most of his life suffering one thing or another. And so to him, a good death would not be what we, sometimes like a hospice death, where we would look for that. But for Paul, a good death is dying in Christ, dying with Christ, uh, would be a good, a good death. Okay, Lance, I think it's you now. Oh, no, I got lost. Where am I? Joy? Okay, I, I sometimes get lost. Uh, two, please. Okay, so what's he saying there? Here. I got up this morning and I was stiff and sore from all of the things I did yesterday, so I'm groaning away because my <laughs> getting old and stiff in the morning. And so, as Paul says elsewhere, sometimes, he sometimes thinks it would be better off to be with the Lord. Um, and that we should be desiring that. But, and what he says later on is that he's staying here for our sake. And that gave Iris with the Corinthians and other people who's working. And so we should groan and long for being in our he heavenly dwelling. That doesn't mean we have to speed things up, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Debbie? Um, because when we are clothed, we will not be all naked. What does he mean by that? What's the problem with being naked? Well, I think in another place it speaks about, uh, about being clothed in Christ's righteousness. Right, exactly. So it's not clothed in the sense of putting clothes on. It's being naked without being, as uh, Tim was saying, not being with Christ not being protected, not being, uh, having his salvation from him. You know, that's what he's getting at. But we're not, we are covered over by Christ's sacrifice for us. Not that uh, we'll be running around as a nudist colony. That's not what, he, what he's getting at. Okay. Uh, Tim, uh, five, uh, four, please. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Uh, this, and again, he's trying to be as clear as possible. So what's he saying? We want to be with the Lord. We want to be with heaven. And while we're here, as he's, even though he said it early, we, we have light and temporary problems, but they cause us to groan and suffer. And, and that's going to be the way. So most of us should be desiring to be in our heavenly dwelling, being in, and we don't know exactly how our bodies are going to be when we're in heaven, but we'll be our spiritually clothed there. Yes. But isn't it natural for us being sinners that we will always complain? Oh, yeah. And, and like, no, no, no. And I guess my next question will be if you have righteousness or if you're trying to be like God, or be like, you know, you will eventually, I think, know that you need to be patient. We need to do this, and we get closer to the word, and you will not complain because we, he promised us so many things, and for us to be aware of the promise that it should be enough, but apparently it isn't. Even if we do call ourselves Christians and we follow. 
Well, I, I agree with that. I think it's very human that we complain. You know, <clears throat> we live in, in, in a society and a lot of people complain about their situation, but if you look back 100, 150 years, even the people at the top of the economic pyramid do not live as well as most of us live nowadays. But it's a very human thing to complain. Because it is something from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, most of you know this, know that, and God gave them. But it's not a physical thing. And I think if you follow the word, that should be a really good example of what we should do now in a supposedly, quote, knowledgeable society. For the Greeks, and in Paul's writing, righteousness was a legal term. What do you think that means? You know the good? Not exactly. Anybody else want to give a shot at what righteousness really means? Justified. We are justified. We have been judged and found to be righteous. We are found to be not guilty. And so it's a legal term uh, that <clears throat> the Greeks use as you go for a judge and you're found not guilty. Why are we not guilty? Were we really guilty? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we were full of his righteousness. Right. <laughs> so our righteousness is not directly our righteousness. It's the righteousness that Christ gave us. He clothed us in that righteousness. Is it by grace? Yes. Exactly. By grace. We are justified. We are going to be judged and be found righteous means found not guilty. And <clears throat> we are all guilty because we're all sinners, right? So I but think you're right. We are all, yeah. But at the same time, we still need to do what God would do, what Jesus would do, right? I mean, that we have to Sitting continuously and purposely, you know. You have to try to live like Christ-like. Yeah, but can we? No. <laughs> we can try, but I don't we can think try. we can. I think, uh, I think you're trying. What is, in, in Paul's writing, what does he mean by, uh, this will come in later, but I might as well since it brought up. What does he mean by sin? What does he mean by sin? Separation from God. The, that's true, but the Greek really, sin that Paul uses means transgressions. What is a, what's, a, what's a transgression? I'm sorry Larry's not here, he's finishing up. In our legal system, if you break a law and know about it, you're guilty. If you break a law and you don't know about it, are you guilty? Yes. But a transgression, what's the difference with a transgression? You don't know about it? You knew about it. You deliberately did what was wrong. <clears throat> and so what he means by sin is we deliberately transgress. We deliberately broke God's commandments. We didn't do it out of ignorance. We willfully did it. Is, is the word, it's actually the word, that, the word that Paul uses in his letters that we translate as sin. It's a, a willful disobedience. And so that's what he's talking about, sin. And I'm sorry we got off track, but I figured we probably ought to settle that. And so it's a willful disobedience of God's commands. It's not doing it out of ignorance. It's willfully transgression. Willfully breaking the law. God's law.
And so, yeah, I've grown quite a bit this morning. <clears throat> I got up because I did too much yesterday. And you know, I know Dr. Jara sees it some, and I know, I know you all probably see it in some people, but sometimes I see people hanging on to life. Hanging on to life. Uh, and I feel it because they don't know where they're going. Do you feel that you don't know where you're going? That you would be hanging on to life if you were really suffering? Now I, re I realize that for some, you know, we all fear death. And I think most of us actually fear the suffering and the pain that's involved in it. We all probably have different uh, things that really bother us for me. I'm a little claustrophobic, so Something collapsing in on me or me drowning is probably the most fearful way I, when I think about death, the most fearful way of dying. And we all probably have something different, but I think as a Christian we shouldn't fear death that much. We might fear the suffering, we might fear the pain, we might fear the loss of loved ones, but we shouldn't fear death by itself because we should have a belief of something better. Is that, does that resonate at all with people. 100 percent of us are not going to get out of this world alive. <laughs> it's a guarantee. What are the few guarantees in, in life? The other one of course is always said to be taxes. We all, you know, I think we should not be looking forward to death. We've got things to do here. Things to reconcile. But uh, I don't think uh, we should be the fear of death itself. I don't, I'm looking forward to dying. Anyway, so don't cut your life short, is what Paul has been trying to say. be clothed in our heavenly dwelling. I think, you know, there's uncertainty exactly what we are going to be in the time between our death and when the second coming and, and again, Paul is not clear at all about this. You know, there's a lot of different thoughts on, on what happens to us in the time between our death and the time of the second covenant when we're supposed to all be risen. And I don't think anybody's feelings or thoughts about that are wrong because I think it's, to me, it's somewhat gay. But it's clear to me from this passage that we're not going to be a disembodied spirit. <laughs> that we're going to be clothed with, with our heavenly body. And when we are actuated, you might say, in the current terminology, it's not clear to me. But I, it, it's pretty clear that we're not going to be floating around like a ghost. Anybody have I, This is one where I, any answer is probably right. Uh, anybody have any other feelings or want to share how they feel about that situation? What we're talking about is the time between death and our interest in the heaven. You know, to me it's one of those things, I'm not real sure what's going to happen. You know, we'll just have to wait and see. Because uh, in all the places in the Bible, in Paul's letters, it's not really clear there's obviously not a purgatory. That's something that Catholics made up. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not be biased. Um, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's clear from this passage and some others that we're going to be clothed in heavenly body. We're not going to be disemboweled body uh, spirit. So it seems, it seems that um, that some passages talk about um, that the uh, that the dead, you know, those who have will rise 
again. Mm -hmm. um, so are they asleep during this time? You know, between death and between that resurrection, or are we, or are we going to be, you know, with Jesus the day that we die? And then, you know, he said to the, the thief on the cross, "Today you will be with me in paradise." Right, and so, and that's why it's it's unclear. You know, Paul uses to sleep as a metaphor for death. And so some, sometimes you have to look at it that way. And that's why it's not clear. Jesus said, you'll, you'll be with me today. He was talking to one of the, the people on the cross with him. That you'll be in, in heaven with me today. But other passages aren't clear. And that's one of the things I'm not sure about. You know, it, it, you got to realize, and we've talked about it this before, that, that we have the synoptic uh, gospels, which basically talk about Jesus life and a lot of things that he said and then we have letters and the letters are really that they're letters directed in this case to Corinth about particular problems they're not like we would have as a thesis that, that completely outlines everything so it's he doesn't give the, it, uh, ever give a complete uh, discussion of, of certain things, and this is one of them. I don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't think you, I don't think you, I think you can have feel one way or another without Can I take a guess? Yeah, you can take a guess. Okay, so when you die, it's in you know, you're present in the uh, universe, but that's a spiritual thing, and if you're um, buried, you, you have your you have your skeletal body that's going to be taken up when he comes and then when you in his presence you're going to be given a new body right that's what it says but yeah. the timing is not yeah. laid out <laughs> at least yeah. to my that's exactly what it says but <clears throat> what is the timing of that <clears throat> i don't know I mean, you know it's one of the things until I don't he comes you're in your body i mean your skeletal body and um, and I guess you're sleeping, but then, you, and then when, his, when the rapture comes, they're risen up. And yeah, it says risen. that we're going to be come up first, and the people then, well, assuming I'm dead by then, uh, yeah. we're going <laughs> to, the ones that are dead will come up first, and then the ones that are still alive will come up. But, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, Tim quoted the passage. They, where Jesus was talking to one of the other criminals on the cross. Uh, some of you know, the other passages kind of imply that we'll be, they'll, we'll be coming up at the time of the second coming. <clears throat> and so, how does that work? Yeah. It's one of the things I don't know. <laughs> and, I, and I'm quite willing to say that. And I think we have to always look at the Bible with that idea that it doesn't answer everything. And that we might want to know at least the details. Uh, the big picture is clear. You know, as Paul said, you know, this is clear. You should know this. But some of the details, I think, we, we don't know. Of course, being human, we like to know the details. I, I want to know exactly, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that. Um, but sometimes we don't know. And I think it's reasonable to have uh, different... Uh, feelings or beliefs exactly how this is going to work. <clears throat> but I don't think it's all that important. Because if you again look at the big picture, after we die, we're, at some point, <clears throat> maybe right then, or maybe a little bit later, we're going to be heaven clothed in a new body with Christ. And we are going to be justified, our righteousness proven by His sacrifice for our sin, to take away our sins. So that we are, when we are judged in front of God, we'll be found not guilty. And so we can say that that's the big picture we've got to look at. The details, eh, as humans we really want to know the details, but sometimes that's not all that important. I think the thief on the cross is a good example of God's love for us. You know, you know when he died, he was in the presence of God, he still loved you so much. If you confess your sins, just before you die, he's ready to take you because that's how much love he has for all of us.
I'm going to give a sneak preview since we brought this up about next week's class, which is reconciliation. Reconciliation with God to human started with me. Christ's life and sacrifice is basically a reconciliation between God and man. <clears throat> Who started that? Where did it come from? Who wanted to be reconciled first? Who made the first step to be reconciled? Was it us or God? It was God. God wanted to be reconciled with us. That's why he sent Christ. This is next week's class. Uh, but since Debbie brought it up, I'll give us a sneak preview. We didn't ask to be reconciled. God sent Christ to be reconciled. He's made the first step. And so that shows the depth of his love for us. I and mean, even when we were transgression, sinning against him, rebelling against him, he loved us enough to make the first step to be reconciled with us. Anyway, we'll go through that next week. Dr. Mitchell, yeah? I have the initial question about you know, when we die. When we die, our physical body is going to deteriorate where we ever. But doesn't our soul go to heaven if we are one of the Christians? That was always my thought. That is what was wrong to our parents. What it clearly says is that you know, our spirit will be clothed with a new body. That's what Paul has been saying. And it will be with Christ in heaven. The details that we've been talking about is exactly the timing of that. You know, because you know, what Tim was quoting is when Christ was talking to one of the other criminals on the, on one of the other crosses, said, you'll be in heaven with me tonight, today. But it also talks in some of the letters about the rapture, that, you know, when the second coming comes, you know, the ones that have fallen, as Paul uses, fallen asleep, that in his was metaphor of death, they'll rise to be with Christ, and then the ones that are believers that are still alive will then rise. And so the question I've always been is, so what happens to the ones that have died now, before the second coming? Where are they? In what situation? When do they when are, do they get with Christ? Are they there now? And how does that work? Well, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't think it's clear. Um, and so I think it's pretty reasonable to have different thoughts on that that are probably, you know, reasonable. But it's one of the details that sometimes I would like to know, being very human. I like to know the details of things, but sometimes you got to look at the big picture, which is we are going to be with Christ, and we're going to be clothed, our spirit, our soul, be clothed in a new body. Another detail is what is that new body going to be like? Well, it gives some generalities about what it is, but exactly how that works. It says that we should be able to, we will be able to recognize other people. So am I going to have my big nose? <laughs> are they going to uh, are they going to be able to recognize me by my spirit? You know, how does that work? Well, I don't know either. That's one of the things I don't know. Tim, you look like you wanted to say something. Oh no, I, I was just thinking though that um, you know, have you ever read about the, the near death experiences that people have? Yeah. And they, I don't know, you know, I don't know how real those are, but that's the trouble. <laughs> people see a bright light, or they are in heaven, you know, or... Um, yeah, I, I take those uh, as our metaphor, a grain of salt, so I, I don't know how that works. Yeah. I'm not sure how, you know, is that just some neurological, or, you know, how that works, you yeah. so know. I, I don't know, you know, the answer to that. And I, But in some ways it's not all that important, because if you can 
And we start off saying, Paul is saying, you know, our troubles are light and momentary. Does anybody ever have a light and momentary trouble in, in this world? The answer, no. But what he's trying to say is, compared to the, the big picture, they are. You know, our existence here uh, is so small compared to existence once we're in heaven. That anything that happened here, even though in the midst of it, I've never had a light and momentary problem in my life. Uh, <laughs> It, it, but if you look at the big picture, the big picture is yes, we'll be in heaven, we'll be Christ, we'll be clothed with a new body, but you know how that works and the timing, I, I don't know. Because you can make a good argument for what Tim was saying about what Christ told the other criminal, that we'll go immediately once we die up to heaven. But again, it says elsewhere that the dead will, the ones that are sleeping in Christ will rise at the time of the second coming. And so how does that work? Anybody else want to throw out how they feel? I wonder if paradise is not really heaven. That, uh, because there's no linear time in heaven. And uh, like a blink of an eye to the Lord is like 2,000 years. You mm -hmm. know? And so what I, I mean like when my husband was passing away, he asked me, what do you think is going to happen? And I, this is what I said, based on paradise. I said, well, when you die, you will be in the presence of the Lord in paradise. Mm -hmm. And then um, I said, there's no time element there. In the blink of an eye, we're all going to be in heaven together. Okay. Or using the modern thought process about computers, are we going to be you know, turned off and rebooted at the time <laughs> that we're going to be in heaven? Are we going to be in you know, nowhere land? Clearly, we're not going to be disembowled spirits. That's what Paul is saying. We're going to be clothed or something. I think you put it um, on the nail, though, like on the head, because we as humans, we tend to always want an answer for things. Mm -hmm. And God intentionally keeps things secret, you know, or doesn't reveal them until, like, a time that is necessary for us to know. It. And so, for this case in particular, I think we're being typically humans and wanting to know an answer that we will eventually receive. But it's not for us to know right now. Like you said, the bigger picture, we've got to look at the bigger picture. And that's our problem as humans. We always try to make God's sinfulness complicated. Right. And so that is our biggest problem, is like we tend to ponder and things like that where um, I think our thought process should be um, maybe given to other things that are of more importance. And I think he does that a lot of times to keep us humble and also not to focus or idolize certain things like that. Because then it's going to be an issue where right now it's not an issue if you don't know. It's, it's an unknown. So if it is, then you get, you know, you get controversies, and and I, I see that how even in science today, you know, or even like with the idea of evolution and how they have a, you know, like they want to have a reason behind everything that we do, but God doesn't operate like that. He operates you know, on His own <laughs> rhyme and reason. I couldn't agree more. I think that as we've been talking, it's a very human thing to want to know the details and, and, and obsess sometimes over those details where well, we should be looking at the big picture. The big picture is that we're going to be in heaven in a new body and we'll be with the Lord. Exactly how that works. Well, it's up to God, but and, and maybe and he does. He, at least in the writings that we have, we, he doesn't outline exactly how that's going to work. But, and you're right. We, we tend to, as humans obsess over that. Um, but I think the big picture is, is a loving God. We're not going to be put in a, in a situation where we are suffering in whatever, however that works. You know, there's. As we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, there's nothing in the Bible 
biblical, it talks about a purgatory. That's something my bias is. Some people came up with trying to extract more money out of people. Uh, <laughs> but it's funny how it actually comes out as like we were told, depending on how you're raised, how you were raised, like either we were told by a church or someone. Like, like I remember very specifically in Sunday school, like they would always tell us you're going to heaven, but they they never really um, said what the process was, like what the true process was. But everybody, it's, it's interesting when you talk to everybody and how they were raised, because everybody was raised differently, went to different churches, you know, at some point, and 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 what they learned or their idea of heaven is. Because it's very different. Even in Christian churches, it's very different. <laughs> As a human, and we see that in our literature, it's really easy to think and make guesses about what hell is like. You know, it's one of my favorite uh, uh, country music uh, uh, writers uh, that basically said there's nothing hell down here, we don't need to know about hell. Yeah, you don't need to give it. He's talking about a preacher doing fire and brimstone type of preaching. He's, he wanted to talk about how to get to heaven and about the angels. Because there's enough hell down here. It's out by the airport. You know, so all the, that's one of, the, one of my favorite songs. We can figure out what hell is like fairly easy because of our human experience here on, on the world. The problems we've all had the problems we've seen about. Can we really conceptualize what heaven is like? I mean, even some of our greatest writers like Dante and, and Milton and others had a really hard time describing what heaven would be like, what paradise would be like, you know. Even in the Bible it's thought we're not going to have tears and, and things like that. But I think we all have a hard time conceptualizing what that I think that's our human nature. Back to yeah. Don't you think? Well, I personally feel and very adamant about that. When God left to go back to His Father, what did He give us? The Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to lead us every day. So if we're confronted with all of these questions about where we're going to go and what it is. All of you guys on the praise team are quite excused. And, uh, <laughs> as I ask, because we're having a deacon's meeting about timing, so we'll talk about that okay. later. But I seriously think that we're going to have to face the fact that we're going to have to face the fact that whether it's my own personal lesson in this paper, I always go to the Word and I ask, oh, how do you want me to do this? So, uh, what do you think I should do? Um, how, and the, the thing is so wonderful, no matter what you ask God, mm -hmm. oh Jesus and Jesus, He will show you, I think, for me anyway. No, completely. We got really off. So who read last? <laughs> uh, I think it was supposed to be Karen. And so back to Lynn. Fine, please. <clears throat> now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So the Spirit is the deposit. What is a deposit? I'm oh, sorry? That's a down payment. Down payment, exactly. It's a down payment. It's a, it's a short, uh, something that you're giving, but is it everything that you're going to be given? You make a deposit. You make a deposit the first payment on your mortgage. That's what a deposit is. A guarantee that you're going to, in this place, the bank 
or wherever you're getting the mortgage from, it's going to get something more from you. So it, a deposit is the first payment. It's a showing a guarantee that what you're being given is real. But it, it, it's not all. It, you know, if you, how many mortgage payments do we make before we actually give to the bank everything we guarantee to give? Depends on how long our mortgage is, but a lot of payments. So the Holy Spirit was our deposit. So that means we're going to get more. But it is a guarantee that what we have been given is true and going to be there. Does that make you feel good? Yeah, it should make you feel good. You know, that, that by having the Holy Spirit in us, that we know that that guarantee of all that has been preached to us, it's going to become. That what we were talking about, going to heaven, being, in, being with the Lord, being with Christ, being in a, a new body, is guaranteed. In a six, please. Therefore, we are always confident to know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the world. And this is fairly straightforward. Therefore, we are always confident and we know as long as we are at home in this body, we're still alive, uh, that we are away from the Lord. That is, we're not in heaven. That seems to be fairly self-evident. As Paul has said before, He's, he's not writing anything that they shouldn't have trouble understanding. Not, nothing deceitful or hidden. Why does he have confidence? Why does he have confidence? Why does Paul have confidence? A promise by God? Yeah. And what was, how was the promise guaranteed? The blood of Christ. So, how was the, the promise guaranteed to us? What was the deposit that showed that that promise was real and he should be confident? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> the verse right before, right? <laughs> and so, he has confidence because he has got the deposit. He's got the Holy Spirit, so he knows that what has been given to him is true. And so how do we live? Next verse. <laughs> Next verse, please. <laughs> right. So we live by faith and not by sight. What's the trouble with living by sight? Because it's, as humans, it's the only way we would believe what we see. Yeah. And by faith, it's sort of the hardest thing to do. You don't see it. You just need to believe and make faith. Yeah, so do we ever always see things that are true? No, we don't always see things that are true. No. Our eyes and our brain are not cameras. And so, you know, the legal system understands that. But what we see, that means what we believe in, from the world isn't always true. What is true is what we have by faith. I think I better stop here. Oh. <laughs> and we'll go on with... Uh, Start with eight next time. So we got a little bit off on tangents. So that I, you know, hope I didn't confuse people. But any questions about all that we talked about? I wanted to give a few minutes for, for that. I think uh, Nalani was correct in some ways that God doesn't completely outline everything to us as much as a, as a human you would like to know exactly the detail. What day am I going to die? 
you know, I'd love to know that. I mean, I can make all kinds of plans. <laughs> How is that going to work when I die? Um, but we have to look at the big picture. So, Joey, can you close us with prayer, please? Mm -hmm. Father, thank you again for this time. You know, we can come together and study your word and gain more insight into this life of faith that all of us as believers in Christ have. Help us to look ahead to what is coming and help us not to rely just on what we can see on this earth, but help us to continue to believe and be encouraged by what you are promising to us in the future. We ask that you um, Make these words real to us in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.